like to uh, say good evening, good afternoon to everyone joining us from across the country and welcome to the 2023 Astro. Uh, annual meeting review. And as a reminder, um, ASTRO is American Society for Therapeutic Radiology and Oncology. And each year, um, ASTRO holds their annual meeting. And this is a nice recap um, to highlight some of the important uh, updates and findings that came from that scientific meeting. Um, this webinar is brought to you by Zero Prostate Cancer. My name is Shelby Monier. I'm Zero's Vice President of Patient Programs and Education and I'll be serving as the host today. I'd like to thank our featured speaker, Dr. Howard Sandler, for sharing his time and expertise and all of the exciting information that came from the meeting earlier this month. Um, before we begin, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded. We will post the webinar to our website, zerocancer.org, tomorrow. Once the webinar ends, you'll also see a link to a survey, please, please fill that out. We would love for you to participate and share your feedback on these webinars. Um, you'll also have a chance to share topics that you'd like to hear about in the future so that we can make sure we're meeting all of the needs of our prostate cancer community. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you'll also receive a follow-up email tomorrow that will link to uh, both the re recording of the webinar and the survey. Um, this is just a, an about zero slide. We wanted to make sure that everyone kind of knows what Zero's mission is. Um, we are the leading national nonprofit with the mission to end prostate cancer and help all who are impacted. Zero advances research, provides support, and creates solutions to achieve health equity to meet the most critical needs of our community. I wanted to go over just a few of Zero's patient programs and education opportunities. Um, we are really, really proud of these programs, a variety of support programs and educational tools and resources, all of which are of course offered at no cost to patients and family members. So if you or someone you know is in need of these resources at any time while facing a diagnosis of prostate cancer, please share them, reach out to us, let us know how we can help, but just know that you're not going through this alone. Um, so that top logo there, 0360, uh, that's really our flagship program. It provides individualized case management and helps patients and families connect with financial assistance programs, navigate insurance, find all kinds of support opportunities, including emotional support, psychosocial support, even transportation assistance. So it's a really wonderful program um, we serve on average uh, 142 or so patients each month. So it's a very, very high touch program. Our case managers do a lot of outreach with the patient um, and, and also on the patient's behalf to help tackle um, the variety of, of issues faced by the prostate cancer community. We offer two peer-to-peer -peer support programs. Um, the mentor program makes one-on-one -on -one connections matches patients with survivors who want to provide emotional support as well as group peer-to-peer -peer support through our US2 support groups. Um, we have close to 160 or so um, support groups uh, live happening right now in your community virtually. Um, we have a lot of groups for special populations um, tackling specific topics together. So please take a look at our support group finder tool on the, on the Zero website and find a group near you or participate virtually. If you tend to prefer virtual support, you can also connect with prostate cancer patients, survivors, caregivers, and loved ones in Zero Connect. That's our private Facebook group. We also host a prostate cancer community on a platform called Inspire, and that's an online patient forum with more than 30,000 community members. So finding those personal connections while managing a diagnosis can really help you feel less isolated and more um, a part of the supportive community that, that's all around you. Lastly, I wanted to invite you to our upcoming, it's actually a two-part webinar series coming up on November 28th and 29th. We're going to talk about prostate cancer treatment side effects like erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, as well as how we can reduce um, those side effects, as well as some treatment advances. So registration is now open. We will also drop a link to that registration um, uh, in an email tomorrow. 
All right, it's time for me to finally uh, introduce our featured speaker uh, this evening, Dr. Howard Sandler, a radiation oncologist and the chair of radiation oncology at Cedar sinai Medical Center and also the president of ASTRO. Dr. Sandler will sh share exciting updates today on all of the wonderful prostate cancer re research presented at this year's meeting. And as a reminder, we will take questions from the audience. So feel free at any time um, to type those questions in to the Q&A box and we will get to as many of them as we possibly can. So with that, Dr. Sandler, thank you very much for being here and I will pass it along to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Shelby. <clears throat> I appreciate the invitation to, to speak to all of you today and give you uh, an update on some of the prostate cancer uh, science that was presented at this year's annual ASTRO meeting. The meeting took place in October, uh, early October and uh, in San Diego, and there were about 10,000 people at the meeting. So it was quite a, a lively meeting and it felt very much like we were in a pre-COVID kind of state. So I think uh, uh, it was very conducive to uh, scientific interactions. Sorry, um, I'm just gonna get used to, there's a little bit of a lag, but I think I have it now. Okay, um, so I'm gonna dive right into uh, some updates from the ASTRO meeting. I'm sure this is a, a group that's really well-versed in prostate cancer, so I'm gonna skip over any introductory remarks and start talking about some of the abstracts that were presented. The first one that was presented at the High Profile Clinical Trials Symposium was an update with long-term follow-up of uh, an NRG oncology RTOG study called 0415. Uh, 0415 means that the study was opened in 2004. So about uh, 20 years ago was when the first patient started participating. This study was for low risk prostate cancer patients. I think we all know what that means. These are Gleason 6 prostate cancer patients with PSA less than 10. And uh, they were randomized to two different forms of radiation, a longer one, which was 73.8 gray over eight and a half weeks, or a shorter one, 70 gray over five and a half weeks. No hormone therapy was used. It's a pure radiation study to see whether the shorter form of radiation uh, is as effective as the longer. All right, so um, there's two curves here showing um, the uh, cumulative incidence of uh, biochemical failure. That is the PSA going up after radiation. No hormone therapy was used, as I mentioned. The curve that has the red and the blue lines is the one that was updated with follow-up as long as 15 years, as you can see on the x-axis. And the, one, the curve on the right with the yellow and the blue is from the original shorter follow-up uh, JCO publication from Dr. Lee. So this one, the one on the left shows an even more advanced benefit over time of hormonal therapy with the shorter regimen. If you look at the hazard ratio in the old curve, the yellow and, the yellow and blue one, it's 0.77, which shows a benefit to the shorter course, but the uh, confidence interval extends to 1.17, showing no significant benefit. But with longer follow-up, more of a benefit has emerged, showing that the uh, red line 
is better at controlling PSA. And that's the, the shorter line. And that's uh, actually the, this is the regimen I use for many of my patients. Uh, this shows the uh, disease-free survival, disease-free survival. So that means men need to be alive uh, and without any evidence of prostate cancer. If someone dies from any cause, heart attack, whatever, it would lower the uh, lower the curve. So this is disease-free survival. Um, and on the uh, left, where it has the red and the blue line, you can see that while the curves don't show statistical significance, uh, again, the red line would be considered a little bit better. The older line uh, from the, um, the paper with six years follow-up shows that the curves are just starting to spread apart at around six years. So then if you look at the red and the blue line on the left, you can see that that spread lasts for about five or six or seven years and then comes together as overall more and more men are dying without any, without prostate cancer. Now, this shows graphically why the uh, shorter regimen was better than the longer one. The shorter one, which is um, in uh, red, the darker red, uh, versus the longer one, which is in kind of the lighter blue, 73.8. Um, and we use this model called, um, with a parameter called the alpha beta ratio, um, which varies a little bit depending on how the radiation is delivered. Um, for prostate cancer, we tend to think that the alpha beta ratio is about 1.5. And because the, the red bar is a little higher than the uh, blue bar, it shows that at least theoretically, the uh, 70 gray and 28 fraction regimen should be a little bit more intense, which is really what was observed in the study with follow-up. Now, this is just um, not data from that study, but it's a reminder of when this study was done in 2004. At that time, we were not doing much active surveillance for prostate cancer. Most men with low risk prostate cancer got either surgery or radiation. If you look at the bar graph from a 2003 paper by Matt Cooperberg, you can see um, even in 2014, which is the bar graph all the way to the left, that most men got treatment for low risk prostate cancer and only about 25% were getting active surveillance. Um, the orange bar and the tan bar are radiation and, and our surgery and radiation, and they're about equivalent. So back in 2014, for men in this uh, um, urology database of uh, 20,000 patients, um, about half of the men who were treated got surgery, about half of the men who were treated got radiation. And then if you look over time, uh, to 2021, which is the latest data they have, the incidence of active surveillance has gone up to 60%. Um, and uh, of those who got treated, of the 40% who got treated, a little bit more got radiation than surgery. Um, so this is uh, some impact of uh, guidelines that suggest that for low-risk prostate cancer patient, patients that observation uh, is preferred. Now, I would say that ideally that might be better up at 80%. Um, I certainly recommend active surveillance to all of my low-risk patients. All of them don't have to elect that. But I think probably um, we who treat prostate cancer would suggest that it should be closer to 80%.
Um, this is a this is uh, also talking about the what was going on during the uh, context of the uh, the NRG study, the 0415 study from 2004. So around that time, there was a shift going on from older 3D conformal radiation therapy, 3D CRT, to newer IMRT. Um, and you can see that in the yellow and, and, uh, and blue bar graph, more IMRT. As of today, probably about 100% of people in the US are, are getting IMRT, which is a, a safer and more effective treatment. But it just points out that the patients who are treated in this uh, 0415 study, some of them got 3D. Hey, Shelby, um, I'm wondering whether you guys can take control and uh, advance the slides. It's just not working effectively for me right now. Can't hear you. Yes, I think we can we can do that. It'll just take one moment to um, switch the controls up on our end. Yeah, we're good. Go back one slide. Perfect. So um, in the very bottom, it says 66% were treated with 3D CRT. Um, and that led to some toxicity as expected with radiation. And it was similar between the two groups. <clears throat> if you look at grade three and four, which are the more severe uh, toxicities that were observed and recorded, um, it was 3% in one group and 4% in, in the other group. Uh, and I'm going to tease this out a little bit more on uh, additional slides. Next. So this is the original report published by Dr. Lee. Uh, and the red arrows show the number of grade 2 side effects. The previous slide lumped grade one and grade two together. But if you look only at grade two, which can be a little bothersome, they reported more grade two effects with the shorter regimen. So it may have been more effective, but there may have been some cost to the patients by using this shorter approach. Now, there is there is the you know, the potential to say, well, you know, it's only a grade two side effect and, uh, you know, the control was better. But the um, um, the thing, the point that I wanted to make was the radiation techniques were a little bit older than, and the way the radiation was given is a, a little bit less focused than the way we do radiation now. So if we did this same study over again today, I think the grade two toxicity would be the same in both arms. Next slide. Now, um, when we talk about side effects of radiation, it's really important to, uh, to our patients. Um, and so we as radiation oncologists spend a lot of time thinking about it. And uh, on the left with the blue arrows is a, a curve that I'm gonna show again um, later on. But um, one way to report toxicity is to uh, use what we call physician reported data. And we use a scale called CTCAE, Common Toxicity Criteria Adverse Events. Um, and you just report that over time. Every time you see the patient, you ask them, are they having urinary issues or bowel issues? And then uh, you just tabulate the percentage. And um, in this study here, which is an SBRT study, so not the 0415 study, it just shows that this is kind of an effective way of displaying toxicity. On the right is data from the important PROTECT trial that randomized men to surgery and radiation. And this is another way of obtaining toxicity information, but this is uh, getting data directly from patients and asking them, do you use pads to protect your garments because of urinary leakage? And the red line shows that, yeah, that does happen and it happens more often with surgery than with radiation, which is in the, the gold line, which is uh, near uh, 0%. Next, 
Next slide, please. So that's the 0415 study. It did show uh, with longer term follow-up that uh, the shorter approach is probably better than uh, the older, longer approach. Now, this is uh, another radiation intensity study updated by my friend, Jeff Mahalski, um, looking at long-term outcomes of RTOG0126. And this is uh, an important dose escalation study that randomized men to high dose or standard dose radiation uh, for intermediate risk prostate cancer. Next, please. So men uh, with intermediate risk prostate cancer were eligible. Uh, they could be treated with either 3D CRT or IMRT and then were randomized to the high dose or the standard dose. Next. Uh, this shows um, that on the left, the overall survival shows there's really no difference in overall survival. Remember, most of these men are dying from other things. And if you look at 15 years, about half of the men have died from one thing or another. But if you look on the right, only five or 8% died from prostate cancer. So it's hard to um, use overall survival as an important endpoint. We're treating prostate cancer. So really whether a man lives or dies from prostate cancer is really our most important metric. And if you look on the right, um, even though both numbers are small, the higher dose led to a smaller risk of prostate cancer death that I personally think is important. And our the prostate cancer community has really adopted high dose radiation as our standard when radiation is being used. And it's nice to see with 15 year follow-up that it's it provides a, a small but meaningful reduction in risk of prostate cancer death when radiation is used. Next slide. Now the higher dose radiation does other things as well besides reduce the risk of death. On the left, it shows that the risk of biochemical reoccurrence is reduced with the higher dose arm. Uh, about 14% fewer uh, prostate cancer PSA failures were observed. And on the right, uh, similarly, uh, a reduction in the risk of distant skeletal metastasis with the higher dose arm. Next. And that is in the face of patients getting more salvage therapy, such as hormone treatment, in the lower dose arm. So Distant METs were more frequent in the lower dose arm despite the use of more salvage therapy. So the patients who got the high dose radiation were more likely to be free of disease, more likely to not die from prostate cancer while doing that without the need for any add-on hormonal therapy. So it's, uh, it's definitely a win for people. Next slide. So um, this is a, a table that lists all the major uh, dose escalation studies. Um, the third column shows the different doses that were used. The purple uh, row at the bottom is the current study that was just updated. And you can see by the second column that the number of patients who were treated was 1,500, making it by far the largest study. And, um, and as I mentioned, the freedom from biochemical failure was uh, um, at this at the ten year time point sixteen percent. Next, so I showed in those first two slides kind of very pure radiation updates of two important trials: one looking at a shorter form of radiation and one looking at higher dose radiation, both of which are used standardly today. I'm going to switch from prostate cancer. I couldn't help myself because this is, uh, I think, really important and interesting. And maybe um, in your prostate cancer community, um, kidney cancer discussions occasionally arise. So this is a study that was run by this guy, Shankar Siba, 
uh, at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center, which is in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, it's focal stereotactic radiation for kidney cancer. Next slide. So small studies show safety and feasibility of uh, SABR or SBRT is what it's called more commonly for localized RCC, which is renal cell cancer. And there was this consortium, not a randomized trial of uh, reported in Lancet Oncology that showed that um, local control was about 95%. The fourth bullet down says local failure 5.5%. So that's pretty good. So with radiation alone, no surgery, 95% of the time, a kidney cancer was controlled. These are men, these are patients, men or women, who were inoperable, so they couldn't get surgery. And radiation was able to be a successful backup treatment. Next slide. Now, this trial done in um, New Zealand uh, and uh, Australia was designed to look at more prospectively if um, this SABR or SBRT can provide local control. So these patients were medically inoperable or were high risk for surgery. Tumor had to be less than 10 centimeters in size. Next. So at a median follow-up of 43 months, three and a half years, in this study, local control was 100%. Cancer-specific survival was 100%. 1% of patients developed distant spread, but that probably would have happened whether they had had surgery or radiation. There was a small loss of some kidney function, probably due to the radiation, 14.6 milliliter per minute, decrease in um, glomer glomer glomerular uh, filtration rate, GFR. Next slide. And that controls, that's compared to what happens with surgical patients who also have good local control, good cancer-specific survival, good metastasis-free survival, but if anything, have slightly bigger loss of kidney function. So the radiation group did pretty well when compared to uh, a urology experience published in 2016. Next slide. Now it was done pretty safely. As I mentioned, there was a little bit of, of a loss of uh, renal function but no grade four or five toxicity. And uh, it was, you know, compared to surgery where it's uh, a nephrectomy can lead to post-operative complications, uh, depending on whether it's partial or radical of about 10%. Radiation was pretty safe. Next. So in conclusion, this guy says that this study done in Australia and New Zealand establishes good efficacy and safety. And it could be a new standard for inoperable renal cell cancer. Now, the question that we would be interested in is, well, if it's so good, can we avoid surgery in some people? Do we have to do a surgery versus SBRT randomized trial before we're comfortable recommending that? And we probably will have to. Uh, but it's it's for us in our field, this kind of trial is very, very exciting. Next. So back to prostate cancer. This is an update uh, from Paul Nguyen, who's at Dana-Farber, of his trial that he calls the Formula 509 trial. So Formula 509, I think, is a is a kitchen cleaning agent. But the drug that he used was apalutamide, which for a while had initials and a number ARN 509. So he decided to call the trial formula, for, formula 509. Next. So this was a randomized study for men who have had surgery and who need post-operative radiation. So these men had uh, would be considered what we would call salvage radiotherapy. Uh, patients who 
had surgery, surgery failed to eradicate the cancer at some point, and so additional treatment was indicated. So patients typically get radiation and sometimes they get hormone therapy. So radiation is often given, hormone therapy is often given too, depending on the situation. So in this study, they tried to identify patients with one or more unfavorable features as listed on the upper right. And then they were randomized to salvage radiation with standard hormone therapy, such as luprolide and bicalutamide, or more intensive hormone therapy with uh, abiraterone acetate, with prednisone, and apalutamide, or uh, ARN509. Next. So what they tried to, uh, their primary endpoint was PFS, or progression-free survival. And if you look on the left, if you look at all patients, while the more intensified hormone therapy was a little bit better, it was not quite statistically significant by conventional p-value, and their p-value was 0 0.06. So maybe a little better at progression-free survival. If you look at the right though, and they, you look only at patients with a PSA of greater than 0 0.5, then there is a statistically significant benefit to the more intensified hormone therapy, suggesting that intensification might be valuable for a subset of the patients who, were, who participated in this study. If you look at the overall numbers on the left near the very bottom, it was a, about 330 patients, 340 patients altogether in the study. And if you look at the right, about 100 of them, 48 and 52 added together, about 100 patients were in this higher PSA group. Next. This is metastasis-free survival. Everyone agrees this is an important endpoint. And again, if you look at the left, the um, intensified arm, the blue arm, was a little bit better than the red arm. Dr. Nguyen says that just failed to meet statistical significance. But again, uh, looking on the right, with high PSA, patients do benefit. Next. So who should get intensification? Now in this, what I've seen, what I sort of showed is that if the PSA is high, maybe there's a benefit to more intensified hormonal therapy. And I would agree with that. However, patients should be referred to radiation early before their PSA hits 0.5. I think they should be referred to radiation when their PSA is 0.1 or 0.2. So PSA-driven intensification does make sense, but ideally patients would be referred for radiation before a PSA trigger is reached. Next slide. So another way to potentially identify patients who might benefit from hormone therapy uh, when they're getting salvage radiation is to use the Decipher test. Decipher puts patients into high, medium, or uh, high, intermediate, or low risk based on the tumor genomic factors. And high-risk patients probably benefit from hormone therapy. And we do use Decipher in our own clinic to help decide who gets hormone therapy or not. So you can do this even in patients with a low PSA. Next. And how to intensify treatment. Um, one way to do it is to use the hormone therapy uh, ARN509, aplutamide. Uh, on the curve here on the left, the green one is the best. And that's for patients with a PSA above 0.35 from a different study. And shows that if you do pelvic radiation and treat lymph nodes, as well as use short-term hormone therapy, you intensify treatment beneficially. So um, one way to intensify treatment is to expand the scope of the radiation. Another way to do it is ex extend the duration of hormone therapy. 
and on the right where it says radicals HD, it shows a small benefit to men who got 24 months of hormone therapy along with salvage radiation compared to six months. Now that's a big ask to, to ask men to do two years of hormone therapy and it's not widely done in the US despite the publication of the radicals HD study. I think what we would like to do is use short hormone therapy, but give it earlier in the salvage setting. Next. So this is the, the last scientific highlight I'm gonna present. Um, this is a really important study that was presented at the plenary session, which is the, the highest rated abstracts are presented. And uh, so the plenary session was the five-year outcomes from PACE B, uh, a study done in the UK, mostly Ireland and Canada. And uh, it's a randomized study comparing bifraction radiation with SBRT to conventionally fractionated or moderately hypofractionated. Next. So for uh, localized prostate cancer who had low or intermediate risk, who considered surgery, wanted radiation, they were eligible for PACE B and randomized to the orange or the blue boxes. And their radiation um, conventional could be um, a short approach, 20 fractions, or a moderate or a longer approach, 39 fractions. And the SBRT was 36.25 in five fractions of 7.25 gray. Next. So we had already seen some side effect data from this study. Side effects tend to happen early, but this is the first presentation of the PACE B trial that showed outcome data. So 874 patients were enrolled, and the primary endpoint was biochemical or clinical failure. And in my view, if you're doing a study comparing one form of radiation to another without hormone therapy that can affect PSA, then using a PSA endpoint is totally reasonable. What you really want to know is, is the SBRT at good, as good at controlling the cancer as the conventional radiotherapy? Next. So it was a non-inferiority design. Um, they, what we really wanted to see is, is this more convenient treatment non-inferior, not worse than, our conventional radiation. Next. This just shows that uh, a lot of patients accrued very quickly. It took five years altogether, which is not atypical. That's common for a study like this. Next. These are the characteristics. The median age was a 70. They were all low or intermediate, mostly Gleason three plus four, mostly PSA less than 10. Next. As I mentioned, the primary endpoint is biochemical failure uh, and there was no difference. Both groups did exceedingly well with 95% of men free of disease at six years after treatment. Both groups did very well with radiation without hormone therapy. Next. Now, could that short approach lead to more toxicity? And if you look on the right, you, you kind of see the curve I highlighted a little bit earlier from their side effect paper that was uh, uh, previously published, uh, but updated uh, during the plenary presentation. And for worst RTOG physician reported toxicity, there is no difference between the shorter and the longer. Next. Now, there was a little bit worse GU toxicity. You can see that the dotted blue line uh, is a little bit higher than the orange line, especially in the first 24 months. And this actually fits my own clinical experience with a five treatment approach. It does seem like it does cause a little bit more uh, GU toxicity than a, a more protracted course. And the question is, you know, if it's non-inferior, 
and it's more convenient, but it has a transient short-term worse GU toxicity. Is it right for the patient that I'm talking to? And, you know, I just have a frank discussion about, uh, you know, maybe it's a little more intense. It's definitely more convenient. We can go either way. And uh, so that's often how my consultation visits go. Next slide. So the conclusion that the uh, PACE B investigators came up with that biochemical and clinical failure rates were very low, which is good. And the five fraction SBRT is non inferior to the conventionally fractionated radiotherapy. That's good. Toxicity is low for both, although I suggested that maybe a little bit uh, more GU toxicity with the SBRT. And it's definitely more convenient for patients. And in a way, it's more cost effective for healthcare providers uh, in the sense that. Um, a patient coming 20 or 30 times to my department um, is going to fill up the day more than a patient coming only five times total. Next. So putting this into perspective uh, was a, um, a discussant from Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto, a guy named Ali Berlin. And these are slides that he showed during the plenary session. And he tries to put a historical spin on some of the things I've been talking about today. So radiate. We, we like to talk about history with radiation because we know exactly when radiation was first discovered uh, and early on used for external radiation. Uh, brachytherapy was used very early. The first LINAC was developed after World War II. CAT scans used for planning and so on. So there's been an evolution in radiation techniques. Next. And as I mentioned in the 0415 study, which you can see here in the lower left-hand part, um, showing that 28 fractions was as good as 41. There were other studies that have also looked at reducing the number of treatments from 28 to as few as 19 showing all four of these studies showed that the shorter treatment was non-inferior. Next. Now, this study, this PACE-B study, is an example of pushing the boundary further to as few as five treatments. And this study from Amar Kishan at UCLA accumulated 2,000 patients from a number of phase two trials also showing good local control with acceptable toxicity. But this was not a randomized study. Next. The PACE-B study, as summarized by uh, Dr. Berlin from Princess Margaret, um, shows uh, <clears throat> in the cartoon on the lower left exactly how the radiation was given. So 40 gray, eight gray a day, eight gray times five, was given to the prostate. And the PTV, which is our marginal dose, is where the 36.25 was prescribed. Next. Now, was that dose 36.25 the right dose? Well, it, it might have been. A study done by Mike Zalewski when he was at Sloan Kettering looked at higher and higher doses and seemed to find that you got the maximum benefit somewhere between 35 gray and 37.5 gray, which is exactly where the PACE B dose lies at 36.25. Uh, a study from UT Southwestern in the right-hand side of the slide shows that if you look at the very bottom, the grade three to four toxicity was acceptable until the dose went up to 50 gray. So clearly you can go too high. And these investigators, I think have kind of showed that that 36.25 dose might be in the sweet spot. Next. Um, there's a lot of extremely nerdy radiotherapy details that go into 
one of these treatments. Dr. Berlin highlights in the, in the blue box below the PACE-B trial and a, another study done by RTOG that just recently finished. Same dose, 36.25. But if you look at the target one, target two, and max dose, you can see that they're different. The radiation between PACE-B and NRGG005, even though the same nominal dose is delivered, technically, they're slightly different. So um, there's a lot of devil in the details. Uh, I feel comfortable with my own five fraction treatment regimen, but it might be different uh, at hospital A and hospital B. Next. I'm gonna skip this. So one thing that, um, one of the variables that goes into an SBRT treatment is how much margin to put around the prostate. Uh, and in this study from UCLA, they used a very tight margin of only two millimeters. It led to fewer side effects, but because the margin was so tight, uh, one wonders whether they might be missing cancer. So they need to follow these patients longer and make sure that the cancer doesn't reoccur too often. Next. Um, I'm going to skip this. So um, where do we land today? Uh, so five fraction regimens are standard of care, certainly. They're endorsed by guidelines like NCCN guidelines. They're less forgiving. It's only five treatments. So each one has to be perfect and um, it requires a, a skilled radiation team to make that happen. There are additional studies that we can work on to try to make sure we understand how all the variables should be. What, how many millimeters of margin? What exactly should the dose be to the rectum, the bladder, and the prostate? And PACE B only used men with favorable intermediate, no hormone therapy was given, and no nodal radiation or pelvic RT was given. So it's a little hard to extrapolate from PACE-B to those other clinical scenarios. So more, more work needs to be done, but certainly the top bullet, five to seven fraction regimens are standard of care today in the US, that's true. Next, next, next. And I'm gonna finish with my end slide. And thank uh, Zero Cancer for the invitation. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sandler. That was, it sounds like a really exciting um, meeting and uh, so many participants, as you mentioned in your um, opening. Um, we do have a few questions. It looks like we have just a handful of minutes. So um, thank you everyone for submitting uh, the questions and we'll try to get to just a few of them. Um, I believe this one refers to the very first uh, study that you highlighted, um, the 0415. Um, so just some clarification on what were you treating, a, or I guess the question is more, why would you treat a, a Gleason 5 tumor? So I just wanted to clarify was uh, the, 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 um, that study. Yeah, so that study was written probably 20 years ago. And um, at that time, there were still pathologists in the U.S. who were grading prostate cancer as Gleason 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, over time, the pathology community has lumped all of those into the Gleason 6 category, and there's no more Gleason 5s. But at that time, exactly. depending on where the pathologist was trained and uh, how up to speed they were. Some pathologists were still grading uh, in that level. When I first came to Cedars in 2008, um, I remember seeing uh, Gleason 5 pathology reports. Of course, I haven't seen that for a long time. Sure. So that has gone away. Um, but these trials take so long to run. Um, so we're really, we're evaluating a study that was written, you know, a really long time ago. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That that absolutely makes sense. I think 
Um, in the in the graph that you showed, maybe slide five or six into yours, or maybe even fewer than that, um, that showed the differences in the treatment landscape over um, over years. You could see. Can you speak to the basically disappearance of brachytherapy? Um, it, yeah. So yeah. So um, um, you know, I have this great uh, perspective. She'll be being in the field for a long time, and I've seen uh, things come and go. Um, and brachytherapy, while um, I think used less often in the U.S., has not disappeared totally, um, but um, has, I think, been kind of focused in fewer and fewer more specialized centers. Mm -hmm. And the brachytherapy experts who are really important to the management of cancer, even outside of prostate cancer. They're a little concerned that the, the current generation of, of uh, radiation oncologists are not quite as familiar with or as skilled with brachytherapy, uh, but it, it it's still being used. Now, some, I think, believe that the SBRT treatment that I talked about at the end mm -hmm. is in a way analogous to brachytherapy and can be viewed as substituting for a brachytherapy approach. I'm not sure I fully uh, believe yeah. that, uh, but it is, um, I can't do brachytherapy because I'm not trained, but I can do that five treatment approach uh, because I know how to do that. So mm -hmm. it's a, in a way it's, it's a method, the methodologies have evolved to make brachytherapy less essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could, I guess, I guess I shouldn't have said disappeared, but it was very, very small in that, oh. um, yeah, in that graph. Um, one of our listeners is wondering um, a bit about uh, side effect management or mitigation, I should say, um, and is wondering if uh, the hydrogel placement is the standard for protecting the rectum during um, it, especially these studies, but just generally speaking. Yeah, so, uh, you know, hydrogel is, um, has been studied um, in a randomized trial. One of the, uh, the first one that was FDA approved was on the basis of a randomized trial showing fewer rectal side effects mm -hmm. when hydrogel was used. The hydrogel goes between the rectum and the prostate mm -hmm. and reduces the amount of dose that the, the rectum receives. So we have good data to say that it makes things a little safer. Now, some people think that it, you know, whenever you do an invasive procedure like hydrogel, that, you know, there's a risk of some side effects. And there's a, there's a part of the radiation community that thinks that the side effects from hydrogel itself, the procedural side effects are a little under-reported. Um, uh, that said, you know, some people use it a lot. Some people don't use it very much. Uh, in the studies that I showed, most patients did not have hydrogel. So I think it's not mandatory to use hydrogel for even the five fraction SBRT. I do use um, these implanted fiducial markers to kind of track where the prostate is during each of the five treatments. So I implant gold fiducial markers. Hydrogel, I use in an informed discussion with patients about the benefits and risks. Uh, so in my own practice, I don't think it's mandatory to use hydrogels. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, we actually have multiple questions from our listeners uh, regarding proton beam therapy. So I'll kind of, I'll lump them together, but um, one is from someone who had a very successful proton beam therapy and just wondered, um, or I guess kind of is of the perspective that that treatment seems to be not talked about quite as often um, and doesn't seem to be uh, listed as a treatment option in, in, uh, on, on most websites. Um, and then the, the second is kind of just a wondering if you can mention the use um, of proton therapy. Happy to talk about proton therapy. Um, I talk about it with you know patients frequently, it comes up. So uh, why is it not listed? I think when protons are used, the dose that's delivered is usually designed to be equivalent in efficacy to the dose you would use with IMRT. So there's no 
uh, there's really none of the proton centers are arguing that proton therapy is more likely to cure the cancer because the dose is kind of standardized to be the equivalent of the doses I've already been talking about. So there's nothing magical about a proton beam that we don't understand that makes it a, a better cancer treatment or a, a stronger cancer treatment. So the benefit of protons for prostate cancer, if there is one, is a reduction in side effects. And that might be the case. However, I'll just, I'll just say that that should be viewed as a hypothesis and remains to be proven. And to validate that, I'll say that the NCI sponsored a randomized trial of proton therapy versus IMRT for prostate cancer at centers that had proton therapy. So Mass General, Pennsylvania, Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, WashU in St. Louis, all participated in this study. Men were randomly assigned to protons or IMRT. That would be unethical if we knew that protons were safer. And the fact that those studies were reviewed by ethics panels at the NCI and at each of those centers suggests that it's a hypothesis that's worth testing. So this study uh, was done, it's called Particle, P-A-R-T-I-Q-O-L. Uh, and this guy, Jason F. Stathew at Mass General is the PI and uh, Justin Beckelman at Penn is the co-PI. That study has been done, uh, about 500 men, 400, I don't know the exact number, but several hundred, um, and they're being followed strictly for toxicity. If protons in this study are demonstrate that they're safer in a meaningful way, then that's a home run for proton therapy. But until that happens, it's acceptable to consider protons for prostate cancer as equivalent to IMRT. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we're right up on the hour. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you one more question. Uh, again, this came in from a few folks. So um, will you just briefly go over? I think we you touched on it throughout some of the adverse events mentioned in um in the trial data, but can you just briefly discuss the the sexual side effects of radiation or the or the side effects that you're probably the most familiar with seeing in your practice? Yeah, so um, I didn't really talk about that because it it didn't really come up in the in the studies that were uh, that I that I was discussing. Um, but in my mind, the the best data comes from the Protect study. That study was done in the United Kingdom. It randomized men to surgery or radiation, or active surveillance. So a randomized study of surgery versus radiation, where at baseline before treatment men filled out quality of life surveys, including sexual function, quality of life, and then afterwards. In that particular study, all the men who got radiation also got hormonal therapy, which can have an impact on sexual function as well. Surgery patients did not have hormonal therapy. And if you look at one of the questions, which is how I discuss it with patients, um, do you get erections that are adequate for intercourse? Uh, the surgery patients, about 50% of them um, uh, are have erections that are adequate. About 50% do and about 50% don't. And in the radiation uh, patients, about 60% do and about 40% don't have adequate erections. Mm -hmm. So the radiation is a little bit better, but it's not a huge difference. Um, and it's not a big enough difference to choose radiation over surgery if um, you're debating between those two. Because either way, you're going to be at risk for having some sexual dysfunction with either surgery or radiation. Um, you know, I wish we could do better at that. Um, but, um, you know, 30,000 men die every year in the U.S. from prostate cancer. And um, I have frank discussions about, you know, impact on sexuality and also curing the uh, potentially lethal prostate cancer. So it's not easy to have that discussion. Um, but uh, sometimes I show people the data. 
I pull up the protect paper and I say, here's the data, here's radiation, here's surgery. I hope this information helps you decide what to do. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing a wonderful job of um, having partic uh, having patients participate in their in that decision making, making it a shared decision making process. And um, we're we're we definitely hear at zero that patients often feel like they're informed and and can you know be a part of of the decision making process, but definitely feel blindsided when it comes to some of the the sexual side effects, um, for sure. So those discussions are challenging. Um, well, with that, I want to thank you for hanging on for uh, three extra minutes, Dr. Sandler. So <laughs> thank you for, for this amazing data and, and great information sharing. Thank you. And uh, thank, thanks uh, to the people who, who, uh, who participated. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as I said, um, we'll uh, we'll now close out our webinar. Um, please, we are asking you to to fill out. It's a very brief, uh, short survey so that we can help um, improve our educational opportunities for the patient and caregiver community. So um, you'll see the recording uh, tomorrow. And will be also available on our website at zerocancer.org. So with that, I want to thank everyone and wish everyone a happy and healthy, safe evening. Good night.